let's expose the powers of darkness. As we go through the Word of God today, I want to show you the various open doors that demonic powers use to gain influence in your life. And oftentimes, we are unaware of these open doors. And so, if you've been experiencing spiritual attack, spiritual regression, spiritual weakness, maybe there's a heaviness that's on you, and you're wondering where the enemy is gaining influence, you're saying, well, I'm living right, I'm praying, I'm doing everything I know to do, yet it seems that the enemy is somehow able to put me under this weight, under this bondage, under this attack. Or maybe you do know that there are areas in your life that are compromised. Either way, we're going to expose the enemy, and you will experience the perfect liberty that God intended for you. God did not create you to live in bondage. God did not intend for you to just go from deliverance to deliverance. He wants you to go from glory to glory. He's called you to walk in victory. Spiritual bondage is not a normal part of the Christian life. It's not part of God's plan for you. Now, does this mean that we all walk in perfection? By no means. But this does mean that there is a standard to which we can aspire. There is a hope to know that God does intend for us to walk in victory. So first I want to define what is an open door, and then we're going to show you the various different ways that the enemy gains influence. And then I want to talk to you about closing these, bringing repentance to certain areas of your life. Again, I believe that absolute victory, total victory is yours. And you may be saying, well, I've been struggling for so long, or it seems in my life it's been nothing but setback after setback, or I just can't seem to overcome the enemy in this particular area. Whatever your experience has been, and no matter how many times you've tried to be free, remember that permanent deliverance is not only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it is God's will for you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to write this in the comment section, He sets me free. Write that right now. And let that be your public faith declaration. He sets me free. He has delivered you, the scripture says, from the powers of darkness. He set you free. His blood has broken every curse. Now it's time to walk in that freedom as we begin to expose these areas where the enemy is gaining influence, where he can attack us. Now, as you listen to this, it's possible that your flesh will be looking for some form of distraction, something to pull your attention away from what can ultimately help you. So I want you to be aware of that battle going on between the flesh and the spirit as you listen to this message and determine in your heart, that not only are you going to experience freedom, but you're going to hear the truth that will set you free and it comes only from God's word. So what is an open door? Well, as you look through scripture, you will not find that term, open door, used at least in the same way that we use it today. But while you don't find the term open door in regards to demonic influence in the Scripture, you do find the principle there in that the Scripture warns us that we ought to be ready, we ought to be vigilant, we ought to be aware of this spiritual battle in which we are engaged. And so because we're aware of an enemy, because we know we're engaged in a spiritual battle, it becomes obvious by looking simply at the biblical principles that there are certain areas that the enemy can affect in our lives. So when I use the term open door, I'm simply talking about areas of vulnerability, susceptibility to demonic attack and influence. Now, this is not the same as demonic possession. Let's go look at a key portion of scripture here. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. This is Jesus speaking. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finding none. And it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. Now, it's important to note a few things here that we learn about demonic entities. Number one is that they seem rather uncomfortable outside of a physical host. Demons are like parasites when they possess the unbeliever. 
and it goes seeking rest but finding none. So here we see that it's able to travel throughout the world. It's able to move about. Then it says, so demons can speak, I will, they have a will all their own, return to the person I came from. They have a memory, and also they strategize against certain individuals. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. So demons have the tendency to return to see what kind of influence they can gain, and they're observant in that they're able to analyze and assess a particular situation or individual. So it returns and finds the former home empty, swept, and in order. Now notice here that Jesus says that in order for it to re-enter, it must find that it's three things, empty, swept, and in order. Well, we can thank God that the believer is never empty because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So, while demons do return, they're limited in what they can do to a born-again believer. While demons do return, they are capped. Their power reaches certain borders that they cannot cross. Now, the demon finds empty, swept, and in order to be the state of its former home. And then it can find seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter that person. Here we see that demonic powers uh, call for help. Demonic powers cooperate with one another. Uh, demonic powers can be more evil than the others, so they're ranked by the level of evil. And they all enter that person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. But while demons obviously cannot re-enter the born-again believer as they do in cases of demon possession, this does not mean that they don't return to see what influence they can find. So it is a well-established biblical fact that demonic powers cannot enter the born-again believer as in cases of possession. That's, of course, something that we know. And thank God I don't have to say that as often as I used to. Uh, this is something that the body of Christ has really adjusted on, thankfully. Um, and so it's becoming, of course, uh, more solidified, that teaching that demons cannot re-enter as in the cases of possession. But this doesn't mean we can just go on sinning. This doesn't mean that we can live compromised lives. This doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about the attacks of the enemy because the Scripture very clearly warns us against particular attacks of the enemy. But this at least gives us a picture of what's happening in the realm of the Spirit. The demon returns, looks for the influence it can find, and says, okay, I can't re-enter that individual. I can still lie to them. I can still deceive them. I can still harass them. And these are all verbal assaults of the enemy. So then an open door is anything that makes you more likely to fall into susceptibility to those attacks. An open door is anything that makes you more likely to believe the lies of the enemy. An open door is anything that makes you more likely to embrace the tormenting assaults, those verbal assaults of the enemy in your mind, and to repeat them again and again yourself. You know, as a demonic power continues to deceive and speak lies, the ultimate goal is to get you to repeat those lies so that they can just stop speaking and you go on lying to yourself. That's how thought patterns are formed. But Having taken these truths into account, we must also remember that you cannot systemize discernment. So often when we talk about open doors, what we're actually looking for is this exhaustive list of things that can ultimately influence. So the obvious ones, things like blood rituals, participation with the occult, the use of Ouija boards, these have no place in the life of the believer uh, but my question would be, would a true born-again believer have even any desire to participate in the occult, at least knowingly? And the answer is, of course not. So I want to talk in terms of categories, because I could give you an exhaustive list. This song, that rapper, this movie, that place, that image. And we could be here for hours and hours and hours of me just listing things that ultimately can bring about greater demonic influence. But I think what's healthier to do is not just teach you what to look out for, but how to discern things that are of demonic influence so that you're not having to memorize this entire list, but rather you can apply that discernment as you go on living your life. Because here's what ends up happening. When you give that list, uh, people become very paranoid. They live in this, uh, what I call religious OCD or state of religious OCD. And I don't say that jokingly, I mean that. There are people who suffer with intrusive thoughts, obsessive compulsive thoughts and sometimes those obsessive compulsive and intrusive thoughts 
become centered around biblical themes so that the individual might be afraid of missing the rapture or the individual might be afraid of being told, uh, I never knew you, or the individual might be afraid of the demon re-entering with seven others so that their state is much worse. And so what ends up happening is we take on biblical concepts and then we obsess with worst case scenario anxious thinking and then we embrace this paranoid state of being that is never God's will for the believer. So vigilance, remember this, vigilance is not paranoia. Write that in the comments section. Vigilance is not paranoia. So we have to find balance in this area. I'm not saying that the balance is embracing any form of compromise. We shouldn't allow any compromise. Rather, I'm saying the balance is in how we approach these open doors. I know of believers who have told me that when they go into the supermarket, as they take cans from off of the shelf, they're rebuking the possible spirits that may have attached themselves to those cans of food from other places in the world where maybe witchcraft is more prevalent. Maybe they hear a song playing on the radio in the marketplace and they go, oh my goodness, they're playing that song. Something's going to attach itself to me because I just so happened to be in the building when the song was playing in the background. Well, that is the inescapable logical conclusion that you must come to if you embrace the legalistic approach that I was just mentioning a moment ago, uh, which is not biblical at all. And some believers live in that state. And if you're living in that state, then you're under an entirely different kind of bondage, namely religious legalism. And that is no way to live either. So we mustn't fall into paranoia, nor must we be trapped in apathy. Because apathy just completely ignores the realm of the spirit and says, oh, there's nothing to worry about. I don't have any concerns. I'm going to participate in anything and everything. I'm going to allow anything and everything in my home. And of course, then they wonder why they're struggling so much spiritually. So again, you can't systemize discernment. Let me encourage you with this verse, and then we're going to get into the open doors. 1 John 4, 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. So the Holy Spirit is in you. The other spirits are not. The scripture makes it very plain here. And the Holy Spirit in you is greater than the spirits who are in the world. So going back to my example of that individual who maybe goes shopping at the market, and they're afraid that if they touch a can of peas, that whoever packaged that may have had a spirit coming from another country. And now when they touch that can of peas, they're taking that spirit home with them. Guys, that's paganism. That's teachings of the occult. That's teachings of witchcraft. And we as believers don't give any credence to those types of teachings because they give more power to the enemy than he actually has. On the other hand, we're not going to be apathetic toward the enemy and dismissive of the enemy. But again, we're going to have healthy, biblical vigilance, not paranoia, in this area. So let's, let's, let's take a look at this. Number one, the first open door that the enemy will use. And again, when I say open door... I'm talking about anything that makes you more susceptible to demonic attack. Often when we picture open doors, we're thinking of something that we do where a demon goes, there's my opportunity, now I have legal right, and it jumps into the individual. Well, I'm not saying that there are no consequences to foolish or sinful living. Rather, I'm saying that possession ultimately cannot be one of those consequences, at least for the born-again believer. And again, I know you're, I can already hear it. Some, some may be saying, just give me the list already. Well, that's what I'm purposely trying to walk you through here in that it's not going to be this exhaustive list of this, 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 this. Rather, I'm giving you principles. So number one, here it is, your connections. You say, my connections? What does that mean? I'm talking about your relationships, family members, friends, people who you allow to influence you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company corrupts good character. Now remember, how do demonic entities attack born-again believers? Well, if you study Ephesians 6, you see that the strategies of the enemy all revolve around the concept of deception. And if you are in spiritual bondage, if you are bound, it means you are deceived. The enemy cannot bind you if he has not already deceived you. So all spiritual bondage can be traced back to spiritual deception. There's a lie you believe that has given the enemy power over you. Now here, the enemy will use the connections around you to get you to think and behave in a certain way. Think about the influence that others may have on you. Think about those individuals who, when you start hanging around them, you start to change your behavior. 
You start to change the way you talk. You start to change the way you dress. And before you know it, old habits begin to creep back in. And you're wondering, how did I get back to this place? All the while, you're not realizing that bad company corrupts good character. That as you're hanging around these people, you're having conversations with them that affect the way you think. You're participating in things that affect the way you live. You're allowing their mindsets to be your mindsets, their behaviors to become your behaviors. So often we picture that, you know, if you shake the hand of someone who's involved in witchcraft, that that spirit's going to be able to jump on you. Why do we give so much credit to the power of the enemy? Why? People of God, why? Anyone who talks like that doesn't understand the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm just going to tell you plainly like it is. Anyone who lives in that kind of paranoia doesn't understand the power of the Holy Ghost. So it's not that if you shake the hand of someone who's secretly practicing witchcraft and you don't know it, that their spirits are going to jump on you. In fact, if you shake the hand of someone who's practicing witchcraft, maybe they're hiding it from you, you don't know it, you shake their hand, their spirits are going to jump off of them because of the Holy Spirit in you. Okay, so I'm talking about a balance here. So you don't want to be influenced by ungodly people, but that doesn't mean you quarantine the gospel. That doesn't mean you treat people like they're diseased. That doesn't mean you treat people like the power in them is greater than the power in you. I mean, even Jesus sat with sinners. You say, well, that was Jesus. Well, Jesus is our model for how we are to evangelize. Uh, this is about influence. This is about who is influencing who. Now, if you're around individuals and they're influencing you in greater measures than you're influencing them, then you have to begin to distance yourself but for example, if you go have Thanksgiving dinner at the family home and everybody comes back together for Thanksgiving, you know, I've had people write messages like this to me. They say, okay, David, we're going to go have a family Thanksgiving dinner and I'll be there and my children will be there and my family will be there. But I have this one cousin and they practice witchcraft. They're going to be there. What should I do? My friend, you being at that dinner table is going to be more influential than them being at the dinner table. So your power that you carry in the Holy Spirit will cancel out that power. Now, it would be different if you said, hey, let's go in the garage and bring out the Ouija board and start playing with it. Or, hey, let's have a seance. Or, hey, let's, let's do a blood ritual or a sacrifice. Or let's go cast some spells. Where's that book you have? That's very different than you just being around the individual and sharing the gospel and shining a light and being a good influence. This is the balance I'm talking about. Now, if you go with the old mindset, it's, oh, I'm not going around that. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to that dinner if they're going to be there. Well, where's the influence then? How are you going to shine a light in the dark place if you only take the light to places that are filled with light already? You need to be able to take the light around dark places too. And so you got to watch for patterns that they bring to your life. It's not just contact. You're not going to shake their hand and, oh, now i got to go pray. I didn't know they were practicing witchcraft. No, greater is he who's in you than the spirit who's in the world. So again, you watch those connections and you ask yourself, how are these connections influencing me? Because if those people begin to change your behavior and your mindset, well, now you're absolutely vulnerable to demonic deception. Now you're absolutely vulnerable to demonic torment. Now you're absolutely vulnerable to demonic harassment and attack and strategy. Why? Because you put yourself in a place where you begin to give ground to the enemy. And that's what you want to avoid. You want to avoid the actual practice of disobedience. But you just being around certain individuals isn't going to cause that. Now, again, we have to have balance. We need to be careful uh, because, for example, my daughter, you know, she's four years old. I'm not just going to allow her around anybody because they can do things and say things that can make a great impression on her that ultimately affect the way that she thinks. So we do have to exercise wisdom in this area. But again, we are balancing between that paranoid approach and, oh, uh, you know, we, we treat people like they're all contaminated and we may have some, you know, virtue signaling that we do and we may feel righteous in how we do it. And not in my home, I'm not letting that person here. Well, my goodness, how are they ever going to get around the light? It's different if they're actually bringing influence, you understand. And then we also got to watch that apathy. We don't want to fall into that place. So that's number one, your connections. How these individuals begin to affect you. How do they change your behavior? Are they drawing you further from the Lord or are you drawing them closer to the Lord? Where is that balance? So number one is connections. Watch those connections. And again, I'm going to stress this. It's not just a matter of, oh my goodness, I shook their hand and I caught a demon. Demons are not like uh, 
pathogens that fly around. Or, or they sat in that chair and they just got done using a Ouija board and I got anointed with oil. My friend, you carry the glory. So if there was any spirits that attached itself to that chair and you sat down on that chair, that spirit came off that chair, I promise you. And so I'm not saying participate in what they're doing. I'm saying don't be so paranoid that you can't shine a light to those connections that need help as well. So watch those connections. Don't let them influence you. You be the influence. Number two, eyes and ears. Psalm 101.3 says this, I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I hate all who deal crookedly. I will have nothing to do with them. It's a great psalm talking about this commitment to not look at anything that's abhorrent. Job 31.1 says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. So let's talk about the eyes first. Here's something that came from my book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker, which is available at bondagebreaker.com. And this is a quote uh, from the book. Few things can affect the mind as powerfully as visuals. Visuals have tremendous staying power. The visual experiences that we store in the mind can contribute to the power of issues like trauma, lust, and mental torment, among other issues. The images you allow before your eyes can become imprinted on your mind. Visualization is one of the most powerful forms of thought. The enemy seeks to use these powerful thoughts against us. He uses them to aid in his effort to cloak our minds under the darkness of his deceptive lies. The enemy takes disturbing, sinful, and distracting visuals and brings them to memory when you're at a weak point. So, for example, if you struggle with uh, I, if I say the word, it'll tether our reach here on social media. So I'll just kind of hint at it. You know, some of you have habits with lust and you look at things and you watch things and you listen to things that you shouldn't. And so what's going to happen is when you're in your most vulnerable state in the area of lust, for example, the enemy is going to bring to your remembrance one of those things that you stored in the memory from some previous sin that you had committed. And this is why visuals are so powerful. So again, balancing this out, it's not as if if I'm walking in the mall and there's a banner with some occultic movie on it and there's an image there that somehow what's on the banner is going to jump out at me. Okay, it'd be very different if I actually went in to see that occultic movie and sus uh, made myself susceptible and vulnerable to the torments that come with having seen that. No, what I'm saying here is that visuals have staying power, and those visuals can be used in moments of weakness. Temptation is often based on visual. Or you see something. Maybe you used to be a part of the occult. Maybe you used to practice witchcraft. Maybe you were part of the New Age movement. And there are certain visuals that come up that remind you of a time before you serve the Lord. And when you have those memories, maybe in some instances, when you're at a weak point, there's this longing for the former days. That's how the enemy can use a memory. That's how the enemy can use a visual. Or maybe you saw something traumatic when you were very young, something violent, something that haunts you, something that you had to do a lot of work to get through. Well, off on a tangent here, but what trauma basically is, is your body and your mind and your emotions holding yourself in a state of protectiveness because in your mind, the danger has not passed yet. And so what begins to happen is, as you begin to recall these visuals, these violent visuals, maybe when you're half asleep, maybe as you're lying in bed getting ready to fall into sleep, suddenly these memories come rushing back to your mind. That is an attack of the enemy. The enemy is reminding you of your past. The enemy is bringing these visuals. Now, of course, the enemy doesn't have to possess you to torment you. The enemy doesn't have to possess you to taunt you. The enemy doesn't have to possess you to tempt you. I mean, Jesus was tempted. He wasn't possessed. But the enemy sends these signals from the outside to the born-again believer, and now they are faced with having to confront these attacks. So he sends a lustful thought. He sends a violent thought. He sends um, a confusing thought. He sends a memory from your past that maybe draws you to some former lifestyle. And then he uses those visuals to incite the cravings, to incite those philosophies and mindsets, to get you thinking according to your former self, and that is where you have to fight this battle. And here's the thing. When we are constantly, please hear this. When we are constantly placing visuals before our eyes, 
that are ungodly, we're giving the enemy ammo to use against us in our weakened states. Let me say that again. When we are constantly putting visuals before our eyes that are ungodly, we are giving the enemy ammo to use against us in our weakened states. So if you're constantly looking at things on the internet you're not supposed to, then you are storing memories now that the enemy can use against you when you're experiencing a moment of weakness in the area of lust. When, when, when you watch violent things, and, and you, please hear me, you don't even realize how some of those images you're putting before your eyes are affecting you. You don't know what that does to the brain for the most part. You don't know what that does to your psychology, to your emotions. I mean, it's like feeding your body junk food. What, some, some of these things you watch are so, it's, it, it's damaging you in ways you can't even see. And that damage ultimately makes you more susceptible to deception and torment from the enemy. And so we have to be very careful about the visuals we place before our eyes. Now, let's talk about ears as well. Ears uh, are, are similar to the eyes. For example, and this is, this by the way is just one example. Talking about the ears, we always talk about music. So that's the example I'm going to use. Uh, one example for how the enemy can use your ears as an open door is the music you listen to. Why is that? Well, biblically speaking, music can be spiritual. I'll show you. 1 Samuel 16, 23. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better and the tormenting spirit would go away. So there we see that music can be of godly influence. 2 Kings 3.15 says this, Now bring me someone who can play the harp. While the harp was being played, the power of the Lord came upon Elisha. By the way, off on a tangent, people who criticize ministers for using music need to read this particular portion of Scripture where the prophet asked for a harp to be played while he prophesied. And so there we see, of course, godly influence in the music. Um, and so it can work on the inverse. The enemy can deliver to us messages in vulnerable states. Do you realize that music makes you susceptible? Music makes you pliable. Music opens the soul. And so when someone is playing music, they are now really putting you in a state where you're more likely to be receptive to certain thoughts and certain suggestions. So when you listen, for example, to a song about violence or a song about lust, you're listening, maybe you say, to the beat. Maybe you say to just the sound of the music. But now your soul is being opened and you're more vulnerable. And so then the words that are sung along with that music track are more influential than they would have been without it. And so you are making yourself vulnerable and then saying, okay, fill me. Well, no wonder many of us are walking around with anger and torment and lust and confusion. We're opening our souls. And when I say that, of course, um, as an analogy, I don't mean that literally that you open your soul to something coming in. I'm saying that you, 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 you present that influence to your soul. And that influence comes against you. And you allow those words to come into your thought life. That's where they begin to wreak some havoc. Uh, think about Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The words we hear can also affect us. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, often this portion of Scripture is misapplied to mean that believers have creative power. Now, you've heard, for example, like if you say, oh, you know what? I think my allergies are acting up again. Somebody will emphatically push against what you just said and say, don't speak that into existence. Thinking, well, allergies exist whether or not I say I'm getting allergies. Or if somebody, you know, says, well, I, I'm feeling a little nauseous right now. They said, don't speak that into existence. You're going to make yourself more nauseous. And, you know, I understand that, that to some degree there is some suggestibility there. Uh, but we have to remember that creative power is God's and God's alone. If you and I had creative power, we would speak lanes to open up in the highway. Think about the confusing world in which we would live. So I'm driving along the freeway. I need an extra highway lane. I speak another lane into existence. And then another Christian sees that and says, hey, you know what? I want my own lane too. And they speak another lane into existence. Or perhaps we all speak extra zeros into our bank account, causing worldwide inflation and economic collapse, all because we spoke dollars 
and currency into existence. So you see, it just doesn't work in the way that often we've been taught it works. Now, let me make this very clear. Christians do have creative power when we repeat what God has already said in his word. Why? Because his word has the creative power. So only when we align our prayers and our words with God's will, God's nature, God's word, God's timing, that's when they have creative power because we're echoing the voice of God. And so then and only then when we use God's word is there creative power because God already spoke it. God already called it to be. And so it is when we come into agreement. This is why Jesus told us to pray for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to be established in the earth or God's will to be established in the earth as it is in heaven because we're coming into agreement. Now, having said that, we do have what is called cultivating power. You won't find that term in the scripture, but you do see right here in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, that our words do have some power to them. What does that mean? Well, your words have the power to encourage or discourage, to tell the truth or to deceive, to encourage someone about their future or discourage someone in regards to their past. To speak words that uplift or speak words that tear down. To speak words that bring clarity or to speak words that confuse. And the longer you repeat those things again and again, the more likely it is to become a part of somebody's thought process. And so when the scripture talks about death and life being in the power of the tongue, it's talking about the consequences of the words that we speak on a regular basis. So they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So this is a process. This is something that you're speaking over and over again. It changes the way you think. And when you change the way you think, you change the way you feel and behave. You change the way you feel and behave. Now you've changed the way that you live. So if you're around people who are constantly speaking anti-Christ rhetoric or rhetoric against the scripture or rhetoric against the existence of God or rhetoric against the power of the Holy Spirit, well, now you're going to begin to become influenced by that repetition of messaging, death and life, and the power of the tongue. So again, it's not that I walk into the mall and somebody's playing some rock band that's known for their connections with the devil, and I'm in the mall, and now I got to go home and vomit in a bucket because I walked through the mall when they just so happened to be playing some music over the loudspeakers. No, the, the Holy Spirit is not weak Okay, the Holy Spirit is strong in me. Rather, it's that if I choose as a born-again believer to continually listen to that kind of music, it changes the way I think. And in changing the way I think, it patterns my thoughts after the philosophies of this world, and now the enemy has an opportunity to deceive, to torment, to attack verbally as the enemy does. And so, again, balance. This doesn't mean that I can just go on sinning, that I can just go on allowing this filth into my life. But it also means that if I go to some family gathering and they have something on the TV, okay, I won't actively watch it, but I'm not going to freak out, jump in my car, drive home and go, nope, 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 it's not going to get me. That's paranoia. Rather, you recognize your authority. I tell people all the time, if you think those things have power, wait until you hear about the power of the Holy Spirit. My goodness, that will transform the way you think. So you got to realize you are the light. When light enters a room that is dark, it, the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. The light dissolves the darkness. So again, balance. Not paranoia to where you're freaked out that, oh, I overheard a song on the radio as I was switching through the stations, or my nephew was practicing witchcraft and I didn't know it, and that was down the hall from where I was enjoying my dinner. No, that's paranoia, but also not apathy. Oh, I can participate in these things and it won't hurt me. I have the Holy Spirit, so God won't mind. No, because those things will eventually begin to affect you to where you now become susceptible to the enemy. That's an open door. So again, not paranoid, not apathetic, not legalistic, not compromising, but biblical vigilance. So number one is your connections. Number two is your eyes and your ears. Now this next state of being is very much often overlooked. People don't even consider this. I'm serious. In, in this conversation I've had with many believers, often they're shocked to even consider this as something that ultimately can bring about demonic deception. Number three, states of being. States of being. Okay. So there are sins of commission like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11. through 11. That is, that, that's where Paul lists a series of sins 
it will cause one to not inherit the kingdom of God. So those are sins of commission. Next, we see James 4, 17. There are sins of omission. He that knoweth to, to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So in other words, if you know you ought to do something and you don't do that thing, that is a sin of omission. So there's sins of commission, doing things you know you shouldn't do, and sins of omission, not doing what you know you should do. And then there are states of being that make us vulnerable to both sins of commission and sins of omission. Let's take a look at one example of a state of being. A state of being can be something like anger. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Now, here's another quote from my book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker. A lot of this is from that. You can get it at bondagebreaker.com. Where the, I wrote in the book there, this is not a reference to demon possession or demonic attachment to your being. The word place here isn't describing a literal physical location. It's speaking of influence or, as the original language hints, opportunity. When we become angry, we are more likely to do something regrettable. It's easier to say hurtful things, become violent, gossip, or criticize when you're angry. Out of anger, many accuse and tear down their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, bringing up past sins and mistakes. In this way, they do the enemy's work for him. This is how anger can give place to the devil. So have you ever noticed that in a state of anger, you lose your filter? In states of anger, th listen, people have destroyed their lives in states of anger. They go on living their lives. Everything is great. They got a great marriage, great kids. Maybe they're blessed in the area of finances. They're healthy. They're, they're just firing on all cylinders. They're very much at peace with the way things are going. And then one thing sets them off and they do something violent or they do something criminal. And now it ruins everything. People have lost marriages because of one moment of anger. People have lost influence because of one moment of anger. People have lost their reputation because of one moment of anger. People have lost their lives because of one moment of anger. Anger is not sin. Be ye angry and sin not. And it's funny to me that sometimes we, we, we try to, you know, pretzel our way around certain concepts. Like people say, well, Jesus wasn't angry. He had righteous indignation. My friend, Jesus was angry. And we call it righteous indignation because it was Jesus's anger. He was angry about a righteous thing. So his anger was righteous. It was justified, but it was anger. It was that sense of passion and zeal against something that violated his conscience and God's law. So he responded with holy anger. So there's anger. Anger is anger. And so you have to recognize that anger itself is not a sin. My goodness, are we not angry at the trafficking going on in the world today? Are we not angry at the assault of the enemy against children? Are we not angry when the systems of the world try to push ungodly agendas on the innocent? Are we not angry when we hear how the enemy advances his kingdom in some areas of the world? Are we not angry when we hear about the influence of the enemy taking over the lives of our loved ones? Do we not become angry when we hear of someone entering a bondage of addiction or alcoholism? Of course we're angry. And it's holy to be angry. It's right to be angry. God, look at the Old Testament. God the Father is angry against sin. It says he's angry with the wicked. So anger is passion. Anger is zeal. Anger is to be passionately, zealously indignant against a certain thing. And so that anger in and of itself is not a sin. But, as the scripture says here, be ye angry and sin not. Jesus didn't sin when he was angry, but he was angry. Again, we like to use these different terms to make it make more sense in our minds, and we end up just causing more confusion that way. Anger is anger. Now, depending upon why you're angry and what you do when you're angry, that's going to determine whether or not it's sin. But anger in and of itself is not a sin. So don't sin, though, while you're angry. So that is a state of being in which you can become more susceptible to sin if you're not careful. So anger is a state of being. 
Um, think also about fear. Think about all the decisions that people make out of fear, like those sins of omission, the things we know we should do that we don't do. Where does that come from? Often that's based on fear. So sins of omission often come from states of being like fear. Think about exhaustion. Talk about sins of omission. When you're exhausted, you don't want to do anything. There's nothing you want. When you're exhausted, and this is going to be so key for some of you, you realize that when you're exhausted, you're more susceptible to lust. When you're exhausted, you're more susceptible to violence. When you're exhausted, you're more susceptible to impatience. This is why I think fasting is a great practice because it helps to simulate these conditions where you're exhausted, you're irritable, and you learn to control the flesh and even some of the most vulnerable states that you can be in. But exhaustion can be a state of being that the enemy takes to influence you. Sorrow. Now, Jesus wept. There's nothing wrong with feeling emotions of sadness. My goodness, if you lose a loved one or you lose a career or you have some major financial setback, that's okay to feel sorrow, as I often tell my Aria. I'll tell her, it's okay. You can be sad. It's okay to be sad, and you can even cry if you want, because I don't want her to not show her emotions. I say, but you can't kick and scream. So you can be sad, but you can't throw a fit. In the same way, we can experience sorrow, but if that sorrow in that state now, we allow that sorrow to turn us into a bitter person who's angry with God, well, now we're entering into sin. Or we allow that sorrow to take us into self-pity, uh, egocentricism, and now we're, we're all about self. We're just focused on ourselves. Now we're walking in selfishness, which is the basis of sin. And so when you're exhausted, you're susceptible to sin. When you're angry, you're susceptible to sin. When you're feeling sorrow, you're susceptible to sin. Now these states of being, being angry, being afraid, being exhausted, being filled with sorrow, being hungry, being confused— these are not sins in and of themselves, but in these states of being now, the enemy can seek for an opportunity to ultimately deceive you. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Now, this is key right here. Inner strength through his spirit, meaning there's the inner man who is the Holy Spirit. The light within, strengthening you. He is God. His presence abides in you. And that, that strength from within now begins to push back on the pressures that are external. So then you may be suffering with sorrow, but he's the comforter. You may be suffering from fear, but he gives you boldness. You may be angry, but he gives you patience and self-control. You may be hungry, but he gives you patience and self-control. He helps with these things. So the key then is to, to retreat to that inner place of fellowship with the Holy Spirit in the split seconds where you want to make a decision based upon a state of being. And in those states of being, you are now looking for the voice of the Holy Spirit in those split seconds. And those split seconds now are those moments of decision. Because the Holy Spirit will speak to you in split seconds right before you're about to say what you shouldn't say, right before you're about to post what you shouldn't post, right before you're about to consume what you shouldn't consume or not do or avoid what you shouldn't avoid. Now that's when the Holy Spirit speaks and you have to be listening for that. So number one, your connections. Are they influencing you or are you influencing them? If they're beginning to pull you away from the Lord, cut that connection. It's an open door to the enemy. Your eyes and your ears are you consciously choosing to consume ungodly visuals and sounds on a regular basis? Again, this is not just accidentally walking into the mall and hearing an ungodly song or driving down the road and glancing real quick and noticing, oh my goodness, that was an inappropriate billboard. Let me get my eyes back on the road. I'm not talking about those situations where now you have to be paranoid because, oh, you know, some family member is into the new age and they're joining you for Thanksgiving dinner. I'm not gonna have a seat at that table. I have nothing to do with darkness. That's not what it's talking about. That's legalism. That's fear-based religion, okay? You are the light, but you do need to be careful that those people aren't influencing you. So watch the connections. Watch the eyes and the ears. Watch in moments of vulnerability in those states of being. These are open doors. What are open doors? These are opportunities of susceptibility to deception and attack. And finally, number four, and this one... This one really, I think, might shake some of you up, but, but let me just say this before I say number four. You will find that all of the things that people could list as an open door to a demonic power can find their way under one of these categories. 
And again, you cannot systemize discernment. Uh, so often we want to just be given this long list, you know, oh, I, like for example, you know, my aunt was wearing a necklace and it had this little symbol on it and she didn't know it was witchcraft, but I did. And now I feel this heavy attack. Okay. Well, now you feel the attack because of your belief in the power of the enemy that you think he gained over you because you gave an, a hug to your aunt who was wearing some necklace. That is superstition. And we have to grow out of that. Let me say it again. That is superstition. And we have to grow out of that to gain more confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit. How can you expect to be aware of the glory if you're so obsessed with the enemy's power? It's paganism. And we need to stop granting the premise of paganism. Now, if you were to take that, wear it, and then practice the belief systems of that, okay, that's a different story. But I'm saying this paranoia, we've got to be done with it because it's not of the Holy Spirit. And those who truly walk in the power of the Holy Spirit recognize that there is that balance between paranoia and apathy. You've got to find actual biblical vigilance. Okay. I hope this is, if this is opening your eyes, let me know in the comment section right now, whether you're watching live or on the replay. Say, this is opening my eyes or tell me really what is challenging you or maybe there's a new way now of seeing this with fresh eyes. Doesn't leave you paranoid and burdened, but instead it leaves you vigilant and spirit-filled. Number four is the mouth. Now, Matthew 15, 11 says this, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Okay, so here, Jesus was specifically referring to the strict dietary laws upon which the religious leaders of the day insisted. He didn't mean that no harm could come from what we consume or put into our bodies, like Christians who live lifestyles of drunkenness or who get high all the time. They say, well, you know, Jesus said it's not what goes into the, the body that defiles you, it's what comes out. Okay, but he's talking about something very specific there. So he was simply emphasizing the condition of the heart as more important than strict religious rituals. With that in mind, we must acknowledge that the Bible does in fact speak quite clearly on the matter of what our mouths consume. So Jesus wasn't saying that what you consume doesn't matter at all. He was correcting the thinking of the religious leaders who insisted upon strict dietary rituals and laws, thinking that it gained them godliness. And he's saying, look, you guys say things that defile you, all the while you don't consume things that defile you. But the Bible does make it clear that certain consumptions can destroy your life. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 19 through 21. My child, listen and be wise. Keep your heart on the right course. Do not carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons, gluttons, for they are on their way to poverty, and too much sleep clothes them in rags. Notice here that the wisdom given to us through Proverbs mentions in tandem drunkenness and gluttony. It, it puts them in the same category here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11 through 11 says this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sins, or who worship idols, or who commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Plain and simple right there in Scripture, guys. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So here we see that drunkenness is mentioned here as something that will keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. So this is talking about drunkenness. This is talking about uh, gluttony, uh, those two portions of Scripture that we just read. And by the way, by way of principle, this would also cover drugs, recreational use of drugs. Why? Because being high is a form of being drunk. You're inebriated. Your judgment is impaired. You're not thinking rationally. Nothing good comes of these types of lifestyles. By contrast, we see that the Holy Spirit gives us something else. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Now, some will say, well... You know, it's, it's the demonic influence that's doing the sinning. For my friend, that's just nonsense. The devil can tempt you with drugs, but he doesn't consume them for you. The devil can tempt you with drunkenness, 
but he doesn't get drunk for you. The devil can tempt you with gluttony, but he doesn't do the overeating for you. You choose to give in to the temptations of the enemy. Now, I know that sounds harsh, but it's the reality, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. That's the fact of the matter. Demons don't do the sinning for you. So stop blaming some demon and take responsibility for not using what God gave you, self-control. It doesn't say here spirit control. In other words, it's not like the Holy Spirit consumes you in such a way that he removes from you any semblance of a free will. Rather, what he does is empower you in a way that you can now choose to gain control of yourself. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit gives you, that self-control. And so he's not taking over you. He's not, I should say, he's not taking you over in a way that you have no autonomy whatsoever. You still have the ability to make decisions and exercise free will. And he gives you the power to now choose that self-control. And if you notice, by the way, drunkenness is a state in which you become vulnerable to lust, to violence, to ungodly anger. Drunkenness is a state in which you become susceptible to the lies of the enemy. Some self-pity, you start to wallow in your misery. The enemy tells you God doesn't love you. Someone in a drunken state would say, yeah, God doesn't love me. He's abandoned me. They're now just wallowing in the misery of that bondage. Uh, think about how gluttony opens you up to demonic assault. The way your body functions is that it connects with the mind. So if your body is in a state of sickness, in a, in a sickness that you chose, by the way, as much as is possible, live healthy, make healthy choices. That's, that's your decision. Now, of course, this does not take into account those who have a disease that has nothing to do with their free will. I mean, who wants to be sick? Nobody. Nobody wants to be sick. But uh, sometimes there are things that we can do that contribute to our sickness. So strictly speaking about those who choose things that are unhealthy to such a degree that it makes them unhealthy or sick, st speaking strictly on that, I will say that by you choosing to overeat, you are now putting yourself in a, in a state of sickness, and that sickness now puts you in an emotional and mental state that makes it easier for the enemy to attack you. So the mouth is an open door indeed. So how do you close these doors? Well, I don't believe, nor will you find in Scripture, that God hides our freedom behind mysteries. So often we imagine that we're going to get free like in the movies that people say you shouldn't be watching, right? We should not be looking at certain things in the occult where, where, where Hollywood paints this picture that there's some ritual now that has to be performed or people will tell you, you have to find the name of the demon. You have to find the origin of the demon. You have to renounce what your grandfather did, what your great-grandfather did. I'm thinking, my goodness, what if I don't have a membership to Ancestry.com? How on earth am I going to find these stories? What if, what if there was a sin my great-great-grandfather committed that nobody knew about but him and God, and now I'm stuck because I can't renounce that for him? Guys, the problem is, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you just like it is, the problem is that we take our teachings from the New Age, from the occult, from witchcraft, and we try to apply them to a biblical framework. Why would we get any of our resources from belief systems founded upon the lies of the enemy? Now, I understand, sometimes people will get saved and come out of those demonic movements, but they have to leave those doctrines there. There's nothing we can glean from learning about those particular practices because most of what's being taught in those systems anyway is a lie. It's deception. The enemy exaggerates his power. And so often we're told that it's transactional. Well, you got to do this and then this and then this and then this, and then you'll be free. As if God is in heaven fighting against these struggles that come against us, and he's fighting against the powers of darkness, and he's calling out to you, hurry, I need backup. I don't have enough power. This demon is resisting me. This demonic attack is coming against my power, and the power of the Holy Spirit isn't enough to break this bondage off of your life. Please find the name of the demon. Please find the origin. Please Find that legal right contract that came generations ago and go back and break it specifically. Guys, it's superstitious, religious nonsense. We have to grow out of that. We have to come to the place where we stop minimizing the power of the Holy Ghost. When we talk like that, 
we are insulting the power of the Holy Ghost. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You can be free and permanently so. You say, well, then what's the solution? Well, it's not going to be found in reverse engineering the teachings of the occult and then calling it deliverance or spiritual warfare theology. Rather, your freedom is going to be found in submission to God. What does the Bible say? James tells us very clearly, you must submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. When you resist him, does he fight or does he flee? He flees is what the Bible says. So how do you come to that place? You submit to God. You practice spiritual basics. Get in your word. Establish a lifestyle of prayer. Live clean. You do just those three things, 99% of those spiritual attacks, broken. You say, well, Brother David, what if I was foolish and ignorant and I made these decisions, I opened these doors, how do I close them? Repentance. You change your mind about them and then renounce. What does renounce mean? Is renouncing reading off some long list of things? No, that's not what it means to renounce. You look in the New Testament, the original language, when you study that word renounce, it literally means to forsake, to turn from. And so we as believers get our terminology all mixed up. Repent means to change your mind. Renounce means to turn from. So I repent in that I change my mind about what I've been doing and I agree with God that it's wrong and it needs to stop. And now I renounce in that I turn from it. And in so doing, now you've given influence to the Holy Spirit. And where the light goes, the darkness dissolves. And it's simple. Now, you can add more to your bondage by fretting and worrying and giving more credit to the enemy. Some of you are not bound by demonic attack. Some of you are bound by the paranoid fear that you are under demonic attack, and that's what gives you that heaviness. And if you just simply believed in what the Holy Spirit is doing, you would find breakthrough. Some of you give credence to the devil because bad things are happening in your life. Well, think about the bad things that happened in Jesus' life. Think about the bad things that happened in the life of Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was shipwrecked. He was in prison. He was beaten. He was rejected. He was talked about. He was reviled. Yet he did not say, oh, I'm defeated. He said, even in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror. Why? Because I'm loved by God. The love of God makes me more than a conqueror. And some of you are allowing your negative circumstances to convince you that God has rejected you. You're allowing your trials to convince you that the enemy is winning. When you should see those trials, according to the book of James, as opportunities for great joy because your faith is being tested. Just because you are in a trial doesn't mean you are bound. And the devil is a liar. Just because you are facing a tragedy doesn't mean you are bound. The devil is a liar. Just because you're in a negative circumstance doesn't mean you are bound. The devil is a liar. Stop letting him exaggerate his power. Because even in the trial, even in the tragedy, even in the negative circumstance, I'm more than a conqueror. Why? Because he loves me. And so when we add the fear and we fret and we become paranoid, we create bondages all our own and it becomes a lens through which we now see our lives. And now every time something bad happens, we go, oh, see, that's the enemy. Every time something negative occurs, see, that's the enemy. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't attack you. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that that never happens. What I'm talking about here is balance. Where do we find our balance? Scripture, the Bible. Let God be true and every man a liar. And some of the things we've embraced as Christians uh, can be compared to old wives' tales that are embraced in ungodly culture, where we hear things so often repeated that we just go, oh, it must be true, even though it has no footing or foundation in Scripture. And so we must approach this spiritual battle using the truth of the Word of God and nothing else. No outside perspective. I'm not going to take my cues from the Wiccans. I'm not going to take my cues from the practicers of the New Age. I'm not going to take my cues from somebody who has some pact with the enemy. Rather, I'm taking my cues from the Holy Spirit who speaks to me through the word. So how do you become free? Submit to God. Get right. Is there some special ritual? No. Is there some special prayer? No. If you want to pray, pray. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to say, Lord, forgive me for this, and I reject this, and I, 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 I make a commitment, I'm moving this out of my life, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But to pretend that God can't set you free because you don't know what something in your ancestry is, that's just, that's not biblical, guys. And so we have to recognize that the legal right is justification. That's where we stand in him. That's our position. Nothing can change that. And now we walk in that justification through obedience. 
And so you close these doors. How do you, how do you close the door of ungodly connection? You repent and stop letting those people influence you. Don't go around them if they're influencing you. How do you, how do you close the doors of the eyes and the ears? Repent, renounce it, and stop practicing it. And say, Holy Spirit, forgive me. God, forgive me. Help me get this right. How, how, do, you, how do you close that door of states of being? Well, states of being aren't sins unto themselves, but just be more aware of how you're susceptible to deception in states like exhaustion or anger or hunger and so forth. Uh, how do you close that door of the mouth? Well, stop consuming things that put you in drunken states, that make you high, that make you unhealthy, and now you've just closed that door and the enemy can't attack you. How do you close doors? Repent and renounce. How do you repent and renounce? Repent, change your mind, renounce, stop doing it. Simple. You see, the thing is, we want to be able to just do some special ritualized prayer because many people don't intend on actually changing. Oh, we're going we're gonna to hit, I think I, I feel in the spirit, I'm striking a nerve here. And it's a good nerve. It, it, it's sometimes the truth will offend you before it will set you free. And, and often we, we want to do that little ritualized thing because we don't actually intend on changing. We want to be set free from the consequences of sin, but we want to keep the sin itself. And that's not a godly way to approach it. How do you close these doors? I'm telling you, submit to God. How do you submit to God? Get in your word, pray daily, have a lifestyle of prayer, and obey him. Obey him. Turn from your sin. Listen, if someone is walking in the Holy Spirit, they're in prayer, they're living clean, what can the enemy do to them? Not much. You can tempt them, but they can resist that temptation. You can try to torment them, but they can push that thought out because they recognize it's the enemy. He can lie to them, but they'll know the truth because they're in the Word. So he becomes very limited on what he can do once you begin to submit to God. I, I, I don't often talk to tormented Christians who have a real solid prayer life and devotion to the Word. I don't often talk to confused Christians who have a real solid prayer life and a devotion to the Word. And so you want to close these doors, you want to remove from your life these areas of influence, repent. Change your mind about the misdeeds, about the disobedience, and then renounce. That is to actually forsake. It, it is that simple. Now, some of you will find that as you do that, you say, I still feel the attack. I still feel the heaviness. You'll find that's a lie of the enemy. And he's trying to tell you he still has power over you, even though you're now walking in the spirit. And that is a part of the attack. That's a part of the deception. And you think as someone who possibly is under that deception, well, of course the enemy has a legal right because of what I did. And that is part of how he gains that power, is in getting you to believe he has more power over you than he actually does. Am I saying there are no consequences to wrongdoing? No, I'm saying the way he lies is so subtle. And this is why I have to be very nuanced in the way I teach this because the enemy's tricky, like very, very tricky. He's been doing this for a long time. And so when an individual is facing that type of condemnation or that type of heaviness, let's say, for example, you say, okay, um, I'm going to close the door. I'm repenting and I'm renouncing. You turn to God. He says, why do I still feel this heaviness? Well, the enemy's not going to stop trying to attack you. But he's going to use your mistakes against you. And he's going to tell you things like, well, you know, because of the mistake, even though you repented, I still have some kind of power over you. He's a liar. And so that belief in his power creates that heaviness emotionally and mentally. And it's a real head trick that he plays on you. Don't let him exaggerate his power over you. Repent, renounce, and then say, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And move forward. Stop looking at the past. Stop looking at the past once you've repented. Once you've got something right, move forward and recognize that you're walking in the power of God. You say, well, how do I get that connection with God back? You never lost that connection. You never lost it. You lost your awareness of it. You lost your confidence in it. But he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Not if you're a born-again believer. Why? Because he remains to help you get it right. Shall we go on sinning? No. But he abides to help you get it right. So close the doors by submitting to God. Father, I pray that you would help them do this. We thank you that the truth of your word has brought simplicity and clarity. Help us, Lord, to let go of all the religious patterns of thinking according to the systems of man. Let us think instead according to that power 
which is above every power, power of the precious Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you're lifting burdens. Thank you, Lord, that you've forgiven your people. Grant them repentance, I pray. We thank you, Father, for your mercies, which are new every morning. And Father, we thank you that you've overcome the enemy. We thank you that you have delivered us from the powers of darkness. Help us to walk in that freedom. Help us to believe that freedom that we have in you. Let us know peace, grace. Let us know the beauty of your presence every day we live. We love you, Lord. We surrender again to you. In Jesus' name we pray. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say amen. If you enjoyed that, don't forget to leave a like. It helps to spread the video even further. You think more, more people need to hear it, make sure to leave that like. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more content like this. I teach on the Holy Spirit, prayer, and spiritual warfare. I also release teachings, or I also release videos, I should say, where the power of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated in all of those areas. And when you do subscribe, Make sure that you click the notification bell so that you can receive notices whenever we put out new content. Now, let me take a moment to encourage you, don't be afraid. So much is going on in our world today, and we're being inundated with messaging about collapse and calamity. And I'm not here to say what is or is not going to happen. I don't know the future. Only the Lord knows the future. What I do know is this that whatever does happen, God's going to take care of me. I love this old quote that goes something to the effect of, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And isn't that so true? We can place our confidence in him. Maybe your faith has been shaken because of the things you're hearing in the news. You're seeing as you scroll across the social media feeds, different declarations, as I said, of collapse and calamity and chaos and you feel overwhelmed, bombarded, and even though you trust in God, there's still uneasiness in your spirit in regards to your future, to your family, to your children, to the dreams that God placed in your heart. He who promised is faithful. Let me say that again. I really believe this is for somebody right now. He who promised is faithful. If he showed you what he wants to accomplish with your life, he's going to accomplish that no matter what the systems of the world are. And so I want to challenge you today to step out of fear and into faith. And I want to challenge you to financially support this ministry. Again, I know so often in seasons like this, we hold back. But do you know what happens in seasons like this? We get afraid, we hold back, and then the season passes and we realize, oh, God took care of me after all. I mean, every season we've gone through, think about month after month, year after year, there's always something in the news that's trying to freak you out. There's always something on social media that's cause for concern. There will always be fear. There will always be a reason to be afraid. But in every season, we can trust him. So often we withhold in these seasons. Well, I got to see what's going to happen first. I don't know what's going to be. We withhold our supportive ministries. That ought not to be the case. Seek ye first the kingdom of God above all else. And then all these things, what things, material things, what you eat, what you wear, where you live, shall be added unto you. So I'm challenging you now to exercise your faith. We're going to exercise the faith muscle. I know most of you watching support this ministry. You give, and I thank you for that. But I want to challenge that one who's maybe hesitating right now. And you're saying, well, I don't know. There's, there's this fear in me, and I want to see what's going to happen first. And, and there's that little part of the flesh, right, that just clings. And you're, you're going to find that as you learn to release, faith begins to flood you. Peace begins to flood you. And you don't know how the Lord will respond. The Lord can turn anything around in 24 hours. He can turn anything around in an instant. Trust him. You're not going to ever regret trusting the Lord. And just like every season before this, when they said this is going to happen or that is going to happen or everything's going to be this or that, just like every other season, you're going to go past it. It's going to pass. You're going to look back and you're going to say, oh, God took care of me again. So go right now to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. And I want to challenge you to sign up to become a monthly ministry supporter. Maybe you used to be a monthly partner, and maybe a while ago you just said, well, well, we'll forego that for now. I want to challenge you, sign up again to become a monthly ministry supporter. You know, week after week, our ministry is still growing. That's the faithfulness of God. His hand is in this ministry, and I want you to get involved 
with the favor of God that's on this work. The favor of God is on his work in this ministry. No doubt about that. We're seeing growth after growth and the, the territory is being expanded. So get involved with it. Let's make a difference. Now is not the time to hold back and say, let's be afraid. Now is the time to step forward and say, there's a need in the world and I'm going to be a part of it. So let's join hands together and let's join hands together from around the world and let's put our focus on a cause the cause for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our mission. There's no mission, no work, no need, no message more important than the gospel. Get involved today. Sign up to become a partner for $10 a month, $30 a month. Some of you can do 50 or 100 a month, but do that right now and say, you know what? I'm going to partner with this ministry by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Maybe you're not ready to do monthly, or maybe you do monthly already. You say, I just want to invest something in this ministry additionally. You can do that right now, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Now, you can give from anywhere in the world. We accept all sorts of different currencies, even cryptocurrency now. So I'm asking you, if you're giving internationally, try the website first. If the website doesn't work out for you, then you can give through YouTube or Facebook. Do that now. Say yes to the Holy Spirit as he's speaking to you. Say no to that fear that is rooted in the flesh and watch what God will do. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.